Beta FPV have updated their 65 millimeter tiny whoop line again. Whoopity doo. Oh, whoop. Whoopity doo. Who cares? You care. At least if you like tiny whoops that fly better, rubber. What if I told you that instead of like a typical kind of, I don't know, 19 grams, that's pretty good for a tiny whoop. 19 grams, anything under 20 grams is pretty good. What if I told you that these new Beta FPV Air 65s came in at, holy crap, 17 grams, 17.2 grams and 17.3 grams and two grams. That's like 10, 12% less weight. And that's, well, what is it? That's what we're here to find out. I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're going to learn something today. In many ways, the new Beta FPV Air 65 Tiny Whoop is not that different from 65 millimeter Tiny Whoops that we've seen before, including the Happy Model Mobula 6 and the Beta FPV Meteor 65 series. What makes it different is the steps that Beta FPV have taken to reduce the weight. And we're going to talk about those steps in this video, but we shouldn't assume that you already know everything there is to know about quadcopters that came before it. So we're also going to dive in and talk about the general specs and features. Uh, and here are some things that are not that different from Tiny Whoops that came before it. The flight controller is a Beta FPV all-in-one flight controller. That means it has the flight controller, the ESC, and the video transmitter on board. If you look closely, you'll see there is no separate discrete video transmitter. That video transmitter is rated at up to 400 milliwatts, which is the highest number that we see on Tiny Whoops these days. The actual output power is probably not going to hit 400 milliwatts. We'll test it with a power meter and we'll get a sense of where it's at. The range and penetration is helped a little bit by the mounting of the antenna. So here's the video antenna and the antenna itself is nothing really impressive to speak of. It's just a piece of wire cut to the right length. And that's typical for saving weight on these little quadcopters. But a lot of times, like if we look at this quadcopter, a lot of times the antenna is just kind of hanging off the back, right? And that's not ideal. We really want it kind of up in the air would get a little elevation and that'll help with the with the range. It's nice that it's mounted here and that's probably also going to help with the durability since it's going to keep it out of the props. I'm always happy when I see that they use a UFL connector for the video antenna instead of direct soldering it. If the antenna is soldered on then if you damage the antenna you have to solder the new antenna on it. and that's some pretty fiddly soldering even for somebody who's comfortable with soldering like me. The UFL connector means that if we do damage this antenna or if we wanted to add a higher performance Forming antenna at the cost of a little bit of weight, it would be relatively easy to do it. Just pop that connector off and pop the new antenna on. The all-in-one flight controller has built-in 5-amp BLHeli SESCs. And when we take this over to the computer, we're going to see whether Beta FPV have shipped it with BLHeli S on it or Blue Jay. We, we want to see Blue Jay. Blue Jay is an alternate firmware for BLHeli SESCs, and it enables the ability to do bi-directional D-shot. And bi-directional D-shot enables you to do RPM filtering, and RPM filtering makes your quadcopter fly better. You want all of those things. And so if you have an 8-bit ESC, uh, you want it to come with Blue Jay. Now, the good news is that even if Beta FPV got a little bit lazy and shipped it without Blue Jay, it's pretty easy to flash Blue Jay onto it. And we'll talk more about that when we get over to the computer. The motors are 0702 at 23,000 kV. And 0702 is pretty standard size these days for 65 millimeter tiny whoops. The kV of 23,000 kV, some people are gonna think is a little bit low. And that's because there are actually two kVs. The one we're looking at now is the freestyle version at 23,000 kV, and they also have a racing version at 27,000 kV. So that's gonna give you just a little bit more power. And obviously you could just take the 27,000 kV version and freestyle it, and many people do. A lot of people feel that higher kV motors are just better all around for these little tiny whoops. For a drone that's trying to save as much weight as possible, it's interesting to me that Beta FPV have put a discrete receiver on here. We can see that this receiver is, well, it's not huge but it's fairly large for a quadcopter of this size. And uh, why didn't they just integrate it into the flight controller and save even more weight? And one of the answers to that is just cost and complexity. Putting the receiver, the video transmitter, the ESC, and the flight controller all on one board adds cost, adds complexity, and generally decreases durability just because the more things you cram onto the board, the harder it is to make it durable and the, the harder it is to QC it reliably. Uh, the other thing is, of course, not everybody's going to fly Express LRS. So theoretically, having a discrete receiver means that you can put whatever other receiver on here that you 
want. But realistically, most people are flying Express LRS these days, especially on quadcopters this small. I guess another advantage is that it means that if we did damage the receiver antenna on many other flight controllers, that receiver antenna is just a piece of wire that's soldered on. And if that gets damaged, it can be very difficult to replace. Here on the Air 65, we have this little red chip here. This is actually the antenna. It's a special kind of antenna. It's a low profile antenna. And yes, the performance is not as good as a wire antenna, but the durability is way, way higher. That's pretty slick. Some people who have tried to do medium or longer range flying with these beta FPV receivers have said they're not happy with the reduction in range that they get from that antenna. But on a tiny whoop, I think that's hardly going to be matter because like, number one, Express LRS has really good range and penetration. So even if you knock a whack off of it, it's still pretty good. And number two, how far are you going to go on your tiny whoop anyway? Mm. We'll, go, we'll take it out and we'll test it and we'll see if the range is acceptable when we do the flight testing. I can't remember where I first saw this style of camera mount, but I think it's like the ultimate style of camera mounting for these little 65 millimeter drones. It's so simple, it's so lightweight, and you don't really give up anything in terms of durability and it's adjustable. So you've got these three screws on the front and it just sort of mounts in. It's got a little bit of give to it. So if you do hit something in a crash, it's going to give. It's not going to crack. It's not going to break like those hard canopies that we used to have that looked cool, but then they just broke and they added weight, right? And I love the fact that the camera up tilt is adjustable. You don't have to reprint a new canopy on your 3D printer. You don't have to like tilt the camera up and down with the screw and then it loses the angle. It, you just change the screw position, and then the camera is up tilted more or less. But the camera is still completely locked in. It really is an ingenious design, and I don't know who came up with it, but massive thumbs up to whoever did. This is just what I want on all my tiny whoops. The frame is one of the places where Beta FPV made the most changes in the Air 65 compared to previous versions. And that's a bold move because for a long time, the Beta FPV frame that they were putting on their Meteor 65 and all their 65 millimeter tiny whoops, it has been widely regarded as one of the most durable uh, tiny whoop frames you can get. So it's a bold move to mess with success. I can't say whether the durability of the new Air 65 frame will match that of the original. You certainly would be justified in asking that question because anytime you save weight, you potentially decrease durability. But Beta FPV have tried to be smart about where they've reduced the weight. Uh, one of the places they've reduced weight is by reducing the height of this uh, prop guard here. And the next is by reducing the overall height of the cage so that it doesn't stick up as high, but while still providing protection to the motors. But not everything they did is saving weight. They actually added a small amount of material. The diameter of the prop guard is just a little bit bigger, maybe like one millimeter bigger in diameter to give just a little bit more clearance around the prop so that if it gets banged up and gets a little out of whack, it's not rubbing against the prop quite as aggressively. I'm happy that the motors are direct soldered to the flight controller. Of course, I would expect no less. Connectors make it easier to change the motors if you damage them, but they also suck up a little bit of that energy that you're trying to send to the motors. And we really want as little wasted energy as we can get. You may have noticed something that's missing, and that is the USB connector. This flight controller doesn't have a USB connector. Rather, it has this plug and it comes with this. USB extension cable. And I can't decide if this is brilliant or annoying. Again, I have to assume they're saving weight by not putting a full USB connector on there. Uh, and it just means it's gonna annoy the shit out of me the day I need to plug my flight controller in and I don't have that connector with me. So keep it with you, don't lose it, and I guess it's gonna be okay. Before we go out and fly the quadcopter, we got to bind it to our controller. And binding Express LRS is something I've showed in other videos. If you're not sure how to do that, I'll put a link in the video description to a video showing you how to do it. Um, but one of the things I want to check is I want to check the Wi-Fi range of this receiver. And I want to check what version of Express LRS they're shipping on it. Uh, I've had problems in the past with the Wi-Fi range of Beta FPV Express LRS receivers. Um, Wi-Fi is not used to control the quadcopter, but it's used to configure and flash the receiver. And if the receiver's range is really short, it's super annoying. It's gotta be like right up against your Wi-Fi antenna. So here it is in my hand. My Wi-Fi adapter is a USB adapter. It's right down here in front of me. And we're maybe two feet away, maybe three feet away. And we'll just check. Uh, and the signal strength looks good there. Can we connect? Sometimes it doesn't show connected. That's not a beta FPV thing. We'll just try going to 10.0.0.1. And yeah, it came right up. It just came right up. 
So that's fantastic. Um, it looks like it's shipping with 3.3.0, and that's okay. The latest is 3.5 as of just a couple days ago, but that's pretty pretty recent and uh, nice to see. And I can just put my binding phrase in. As long as I'm already here, there are many ways to bind. I'll just type my binding phrase. I'm not going to show it to you. I'll just type it in and save. And now it should be bound to my controller whenever I power my controller up. With that being done, let's take a look at the beta flight configuration and see if there's anything interesting here. And I guess we'll go first to the ports tab. It's nice to see that we have all hardware UARTs. There's no soft serial UARTs. Hardware UARTs are better than software UARTs. And some of these tiny what flight controllers don't have a lot of hardware UARTs. This one does. That's very nice. Uh, in the configuration tab, it's very nice that they have disabled the arming angle protection, which prevents you from arming when the quad is not flat and level, which especially with little tiny whoops, it's oftentimes it's a little cocked to the side, especially if you just crash and you wouldn't be able to take off again. They've disabled that protection, which lets you take off even when the quad is not flat and level. I always do this and it's great that they're shipping it that way. Power and battery. I love that they've set the maximum cell voltage to 4.4. Tiny whoop batteries are usually overcharged to 4.35 volts. They're designed to do that. It's not a safety issue and it's a way of getting a little bit longer flight time out of these tiny little batteries that these tiny little quadcopters use. But the default of Betaflight is to expect the battery to max out at 4.2 volts. And so uh, a fully charged ba uh, high volt battery confuses the flight controller. Uh, by changing this parameter to 4.4, they've done that correctly for the high volt batteries we're gonna be using. And again, it's very nice that they're doing that. I also like that they've lowered the warning cell voltage. We also often discharge these batteries lower than we would with a bigger, uh, bigger battery. So a bigger battery we might want a warning at 3.7 volts with like 3.3 volts as the absolute minimum. Here, we're gonna get a warning at 345 with like 3.1 as the absolute minimum. And again, it's very nice that they've made this change. Uh, I, I highly support it. it. shows they put a lot of thought into this setup. If we go to PID tuning, we can see they've got a custom PID tune on here and we'll see how good it is when we fly it. As far as rates go, we basically have Betaflight default rates. I'm just going to tweak that real quick uh, to put the 533 racing rates on here. That's what I like to use for my race rigs and even some of my freestyle rigs. If you're not sure what rates are, I've got a video about what they are and how you can set your perfect rates. Uh, and I'll put a link in the video description. Rates are basically how fast the quadcopter spins, how twitchy it feels, if you will. It always bugs me when manufacturers don't enable telemetry. There's no reason not to enable this, and I, no reason I'm aware of. And if you're using Express LRS or you're using Crossfire or some other receiver that supports telemetry, I think it should be on. Telemetry sends data from the flight controller back to the hand controller and lets you do things like have the hand controller say low voltage when your battery's getting low. Well, you might think, well, I've got all that information in my goggles in the on-screen display. And that's true, you do, but it still can be nice to have it in the hand controller for various reasons. And there's no reason not to have it on, so why not have it on? Maybe they know something I don't know. We do have bi-directional D-shot enabled. That's good. I told you you want that. And that means that these uh, ESCs must have Blue Jay on them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to support bi-directional D-shot. And that means these quadcopters are going to fly a little bit better. -er. And here in the on-screen display, we have the typical crowded freaking on-screen display that we get in many bind and flies. I probably will turn most of this stuff off, but we're gonna just test it out and see what it looks like in the goggles before I start jacking with it. Very nice that here in the video transmitter settings, we have an option for pit mode. We can actually set the video transmitter to zero milliwatts, basically extremely low output power. And that lets you power the quadcopter up. If you're, if you're at a race or something and other people are flying, if you set it to zero milliwatts, you can power up your quadcopter and you won't knock them out of the air. Um, how do you set it to zero milliwatts without powering it up? Well, you could do it right here in Betaflight. I could just go in here and set my output power to pit. And then if I save that, it's now relatively safe for me to plug in the quadcopter and power it up. And I know I won't be stomping on other people who are in the air. Very nice that they've built that into the VTX table. There is a pit mode toggle here, but it doesn't work reliably on a lot of video transmitters. And so just having it be a power level, I think is gonna be more reliable. Very nice. I'm gonna set that to 400 milliwatts, because of course we are. Now it's time to flight test these guys. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fly them on my little Tiny Whoop race course, which I've got set up in the other room. But before I do that, I need to tell you about a change in the beta flight configuration that you absolutely must make. And I didn't notice it until I started flying them. And then I remembered 
Betaflight 4.5 changed the way angle mode works. And in short, what they did is they made your acro mode rate curve, including all of its expo and so forth, they made that apply to angle mode. And basically it makes angle mode unflyable, in my opinion, if you've got any kind of like expo or sharp uh, curve. I've got a whole video about how to fix it. And I'm not gonna show you all that stuff here. I'm gonna link that video in the video description below. You, ha you have to do this. Otherwise, when you try to fly in angle mode, and I'm not too proud to admit that I fly tiny whoops in angle mode because I'm not a good enough pilot to fly them really fast in acro mode in a tight environment like this. When you fly in angle mode in Betaflight 4.5, it just it doesn't, it's broken. It's a little exaggerated, but not too much. Link in the video description, you have to do this. I've done it, and now I'm ready to go put it in the air. And I think the first one I'm gonna fly is gonna be the freestyle one. And you may be thinking, Bardwell, that's kind of backwards. You're flying a race course, shouldn't you fly the race one? And no, no, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fly the freestyle one and get a little bit of you know a feel for the course, and then I'm gonna fly the race one, and we're gonna see if it's any better. Makes sense to me. Let's do it. So here's the race course we're working with. And it's gonna go like this. And as I said, I am not far from the fastest racer. I was at about the middle of the pack uh, when I did race gow last year. Uh, race gow is the race game of whoop. And it's where I got this course. It's actually running right now. They're in week two. You could still enter and compete if you don't mind not getting any points for week one, which probably, you know, whatever. Uh, it's still fun to compete. Basically, they make a course like this. Every, like, two or three weeks, there's a new course. You record DVR, and you submit your times. And then there's, prize. there's like, thousands of dollars in real prizes you can win. Um... I've done a little bit of, shit, I always want to go the wrong way there. I've done a little bit of practice on this course just to make sure I remember the the gates, but I haven't really like worked on the time. And you can hear I'm not running the timing system because I don't think I'm consistent enough as a pilot that if I were like getting faster times with one drone versus the other, uh, that it would be like definitive in a meaningful way that it was the drone and not just me having a good day. But I think we'll be able to tell and I'll be able to give you a subjective feel for how things go. Uh, let's just see if I can try to get like one smoothish lap uh, here and then we'll switch to the race one. Yeah, there we go, that's good. That's not bad there. That was didn't go the wrong way. Switch and outside and around. Could be a little smoother, but... Oh, swung wide there. Oh, gosh. One thing I do want to point out is that they ship this with the maximum up tilt angle set to 60 degrees, which is pretty extreme. Like, if you're a really excellent racing pilot, that may be what you need. But for somebody like me... Shit, I screwed up. For somebody like me, I could probably do it with less up tilt can go into the PID tuning tab and turn down the maximum up tilt angle for angle mode, I think it's called angle limit, and turn that down and that'll give you a little more precision on the sticks. It's like lowering your rates in acro mode. Although, I am starting to get it dialed in a little bit. Oh yeah. I think I can get one more lap, probably. That turn could be smoother. That was pretty okay. Okay, all right. So, three minutes, 32. Could fly a little longer. Three, okay. So about three minutes, 30, three minutes, 45 before the end of the battery. Could go a little further, 45, say four minutes. Say about four minutes on that battery if I really ran it down.
These are pretty freaking cool, aren't they? Are you enjoying hearing me tell you about them? Would you like me to be able to continue to tell you about products like this and more? Then consider joining my Patreon. Patreon is a website where you can subscribe to me. For as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned it, you can subscribe at any level that you feel is right for the amount of value you get from my content. And if that number is zero, then just fast forward to the next chapter and I'll see you in the, for the rest of the video. But if you feel like you're getting a lot of value out of the content and maybe today's the day that you go, I'd like to give something back, today's the day, then click the link in the video description below to head to my Patreon and sign up. Patrons get exclusive access to my Discord server as well as podcast downloads of all of my live streams. And if that's what it takes for you to get you to join up, great. But mostly, I hope you join up because you've been watching my content for a long time You've gotten a lot of value out of it, and today's the day that you feel like it's time to give something back. If that is true for you, there's a link in the video description below. And if not, I'll keep making the content, and you keep watching the content. Maybe that day will come. Now we're gonna go to the race one, and in case you're thinking, well, isn't it gonna be just the same, but with higher KV motors? No, they actually have a separate PID tune for the race drone versus the freestyle drone. And I, I don't know, like, Obviously, there's a difference between how you PID tune a race drone and a freestyle drone. I didn't dive into the details of the PID tune, but it's nice to see that they put in the effort. I kind of expected them to just copy the same CLI dump and the same PIDs between them and go, eh, whatever. It really shows they're putting an effort in. I think this one feels better to fly for racing anyway, as you would expect. I'm not sure it wouldn't also feel better for freestyle because a lot of times what makes a good racing drone also makes for a good freestyle drone. There you go. That was a nice turn. I mean, it's usually going to be the case that your best laps are some of the last laps you did because that's when you've had the most practice. So I guess the fair thing to do would be to go back to the freestyle drone and see how it does. See if I, oh man, see if I get worse. Three, two, okay, we're, we're done. We're done, we're done, three, two. Um, yeah, so I think shorter flight time for sure on those 28,000 kV motors. That's to be expected. You don't get that extra RPM for nothing. Um, instead of like maybe four minutes, we got maybe 315, which, you know, it's only 45 seconds, but that's a heck of a lot of uh, difference in the percentage wise. Now we're going to do some freestyle outside and just like before we're going to start with the wrong quadcopter, the race quadcopter, and then we're going to switch to the right quadcopter and see if things get better. I, I have a hunch that I'm just going to like the race quadcopter better for both racing and freestyle, but we'll see. We'll see. It does feel really good to get out here and fly outside and open up a little bit and just fly smooth. I guess I should turn and face the yard so my antennas are facing out. I do have, I don't know if you can see, I do have like directional antennas. I don't have an Omni on here. So as soon as I fly behind myself, things will get a little worse. Um, the 27,000 kV motors don't feel slow out here in the yard. A lot of times when you fly a 65 millimeter drone out in a big space, the space just feels really big and it takes forever to get from one end to the other and you just feel really outclassed. That is not the case here. Feels pretty good. Oh, hello. Feels pretty good. What about like a power loop? That went pretty well. Uh, it's always a little bit of a struggle with a tiny whoop to do a power loop because you're going to fling yourself across the top and they just don't tend to have much fling. The other thing that happens is if you don't get on the throttle early, you hit the ground because they don't have much ability to recover. But this is doing pretty well. I'm sure the lightweight is helping it not hit the ground. I don't know about the fling ability. Usually a little extra weight helps with fling, but these are some of the nicest power loops I've ever done with a tiny whoop. And I know there's people out there saying, what do you mean you can tiny power loop a tiny whoop? There's guys, tiny whoops experts who do it all the time. Yeah, but I fly bigger drones most of the time. And so a lot of times my instincts aren't right. It's nice that this is just behaving the way it is. 
it flies good. Like it's just doing all the right things. Let's dive and see if we get a lot of, didn't get a lot of prop wash in that dive. It wasn't a massive dive. Three, 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 one. Oh no. Oh no. <sighs> Come on. Oh no. Now normally what I would do if I had a quadcopter stuck in a tree would be to use this pole. It's the Drone Saver. It's at thedronesaver.com, link in the video description below. It's a fiberglass pole and it extends up and it's got a hook on the end and you reach up and you grab your quad out of the tree. But this, this is too high. It's too high up and it won't reach. So thankfully, a little while back, I made a video about all the different ways to get your quadcopter out of a tree. I'll put a link to that in the video description below as well. There's like 17 different ways I tried. We're gonna try the uh, slingshot. It may turn out, oh man, where am I even gonna aim this? I don't even know where it is. Uh, it may turn out that the best way to do this is to fly a quadcopter up there. How about like right about there-ish. Three, two, one. No! Clean miss. That's closer. I gotta aim higher, cause it's gonna fall. It's gonna fall. See, gotta aim higher. Ooh, that's a perfect shot. That was a perfect shot. All right, now let it come down. There it comes, here it's coming down. Shake it down. Come on. Come on, baby. Oh yeah, here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Yes. And... Oh, oh, go. there it is. Woo! Woo-hoo! Was I doing... Well, I don't feel like I got very much freestyle done on that pack, so let's do one more pack and try to get some actual freestyle done. And I love doing freestyle-y stuff around these fence posts. I feel like they're small enough that they make you work. Oh, still got to get on the throttle a little bit early. This is still a tiny whoop, but I am able to keep it off the ground. Oh, yeah. See, it feels kind of like a five inch, not like, that's okay, it doesn't feel like a five inch, but it's got enough like fling ability that it doesn't immediately make me go, oh, this is a tiny whip. I gotta really just be on the throttle all the time. And it, it tricks me a little bit. See, like the fact that you can do stuff like that, I know people out there can, people who are like really good Tiny whoop pilots can just do anything. All right, now it's time for the freestyle. What we should expect to see is less power because of the lower KV of the motors, but how will the PID tune be different, etc., etc. Only one way to find out. Am I going to notice the lower KV? Is it gonna feel underpowered? No. No. I mean, objectively, it's slower, but it doesn't feel slow. Huh. It feels like I'm not flinging myself back as far. Please don't go in a tree again. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I'm not tapping the ground. I wonder why. The higher KV motors are objectively more powerful. Have I just gotten used to it? Oh no, that's bad. What about a nice dive? Not a ton of prop wash coming out of a dive. Let's see if I can not put it in a tree. Pretty smooth.
That's a pretty reasonable amount of prop wash for a tiny whoop. You would really expect it to be just shaking and shuddering and it's not. And I know like tuners can get good results, but just for a bind and fly, that's exceptionally good. Look how smooth that is coming down there. These are really nice to fly. Not a lot of fling back, but some. Really got to get on the throttle for that Maddie. That's the part I was messing up earlier. Oh, really got to get on the throttle. <laughs> Let's try that again. And we flick back. Yeah. What inverted yaw spin? Sort of. You really got to get on the throttle. Okay, I do think I can tell the difference on the lower KV motors that you have to get on the throttle a little more at the bottom there. We are getting longer flight times though. Oh, phooey. All right, bring it in. We can't finish this video without checking the output power of the video transmitter. Here I have got the Immersion RC RF power meter. Don't let the fact that it's got a Rotoriot logo on it fool you. Rotoriot didn't make this. What do they know about power meters? This was made by Immersion RC and they did a little co-branding with Rotoriot once upon a time. And it's gonna measure the output power of the video transmitter. Um, this is about a hundred, well, these days it's gone up to about $150, <laughs> inflation. Uh, this is a hobby grade piece of equipment. It's not gonna be as accurate or precise as a piece of lab grade equipment. So if, if we're looking for 400 milliwatts and we get 350 milliwatts or 425 milliwatts, we're not gonna read too much into that. Uh, if it's way, way off though, we might begin to suspect that something was wrong with the hardware. And also, as you can see, I've got active cooling here. So hopefully we'll get like representative performance of the video transmitter as it would be when we were flying in the air. Let's go ahead and power this up. And it is currently set to 400 milliwatts, and it is reading, well, gosh, <laughs> damn near 400 milliwatts. That's pretty impressive. That's like right on. What I want to do next is I want to just wait for like five minutes and see if it's stable uh, over time. And like I said, we do have this air blowing right on it, so it really should be stable, but let's just double check. Yeah, it's basically hanging in there. It's gone down a little bit, but... That's normal as heat builds up. What if we take the fan away? Well, I, I know what'll happen. It'll overheat and it'll shut down. But how quickly does it do that? Good question. Hmm. Interesting. We can see the core temp climbing here. That's the temperature of the microprocessor on the flight controller. But, you know, that all, that's the video transmitter too is all kind of the same temperature. wonder when it'll shut down. Usually electronics shut down around 100 degrees Celsius. Still hanging in there pretty good. It's been a couple minutes, maybe a minute, maybe a little more, without any cooling whatsoever. And it's hanging in there at 300 plus milliwatts. Oh, I can smell. I can smell the smell of <laughs> hot electronics. This has got to be it, right? Yeah, look, it's going to start reducing the power and it's going to hold it at 100 degrees Celsius. Told you. What's happening? It's just holding at 97. And it's holding at 330 watt milliwatts. Can this thing just hold 330 milliwatts indefinitely? It seems, oh, no, no, 99, 98. It is. It's just sitting at 330 milliwatts with no cooling whatsoever. That's freaking impressive. So like, it's not gonna overheat 
at all and shut down, even at max power. And it can do 330 milliwatts with no cooling. That's, that's, I'm impressed. Um, let's check the 25 milliwatt power. Uh, hold on one second. Features, VTX, power, 25 milliwatts. And what we want to see here is as close to 25 actual milliwatts as possible and no more because racers, uh, they don't want any extra power. They will get in trouble if they're transmitting too high because they will, uh, you know, mess up the race. And we got 18 milliwatts here, but it is thoroughly heat soaked. Let's bring that heat down and see what we get. With some airflow. The temp should drop pretty much immediately. Nope, there we go. It's going up. There we go. Yeah, we seem to be right about dead on 25 milliwatts. Uh, it's a little low at the moment, but I think it hasn't quite recovered from the heat. Seems like it's pretty rock solid. This was all on race eight, and a lot of times we we'll see different output power on lower frequencies. So let's rerun these tests at race one real quick and just see how much deviation there is. Here we are on channel race one at 25 milliwatts, and we are outputting, wow, 150 milliwatts is what it's showing. Uh, okay, well, that'll go down a little bit as the video transmitter heats up, but that's pretty high. Uh, let's set the output power to full power real quick. Let's see what we get. That one's pretty close, 430 milliwatts. Uh, so it seems like the 25 milliwatt power is a little high on channel race one. Um, there's not a lot you can do about that. I'm really impressed with the Beta FPV Air 65. And I'm not impressed because they built a 17 gram Tiny Whoop. We all know that 17 gram Tiny Whoops fly great and that probably 16 grams fly even better, 15 grams fly even better than that. I'm not impressed that they built a 17 gram Tiny Whoop because people have been building 17 gram Tiny Whoops for a while. What I am impressed with is that Beta FPV have developed a bind and fly that the average person, not a person who wants to go and shave weight and customize this and that and get a tiny whoop that's super light and it's a one of one and the minute you crash it and break it, then you got to rebuild a whole new one and it's going to break because you made it so light that it's not that durable. No, this is just a good old bind and fly tiny whoop that the average person can go swipe a credit card, they can fly it and they can get access to this level of performance without going to all of that hassle. That's pretty freaking cool. Between the freestyle and the race one, I think there's a clear answer as to which one you should get, and I think it's the race one. The race one has a little bit shorter flight time, but I'm willing to bet that if you used a motor output limit to scale those 28,000 kV motors down to 22,000 kV, the flight time would be not exactly the same, but pretty similar. And you'll have the option, as I said earlier, to bring that up and get the full performance. And the difference in flight performance between the race and the freestyle is significant. It's substantial. The race feels so much better in corners when you're racing and arguably it feels better when you're freestyling, although maybe you want to dial it back and extend that flight time just a little bit. Uh, pretty much the only complaint I did have about these two was the flight time. Uh, I've had tiny whoops that had longer flight time. And it's not the batteries. We're using great batteries, some of the best batteries. It's a BT 2.0 connector. I just feel like there's something about this design. Must be the motors, right? Now the flight time is not exceptional. It's not terrible, but I would like it to be just a little bit longer. Whether you're interested in picking up the race or the freestyle version, can I remind you that there are links in the video description below to these products and they are affiliate links. What that means is that when you click that link and then you make any purchase at the affiliated store, I get a small percent of everything you bought. So you're gonna buy these, you're gonna buy props, you're gonna buy batteries, whatever you're gonna buy, go find an affiliate link underneath one of my videos to that store and uh, just click it and then do all your shopping. And it's the simplest way for you to support the channel. It doesn't cost you anything. It just takes the, it costs you the time to go find the link. And you could even bookmark those links and just use them to get to the stores if you wanted to. I'm not saying you have to, but it sure does mean a lot. But before you make that purchase, you should look at this. This is the Happy Model Mobula 6 2024 edition. And guess what it weighs? Just about the same. 
18 grams, 17 grams. Ooh, that's almost one gram. It weighs just about the same and has many of the same specs and features, uh, but does it fly better? And in order to answer that question, I'm gonna put a card on screen where I flew this quadcopter in race gal last year and you can see how it flies and start to get i didn't do a full review of it but i think it is a worthy competitor and i think you should definitely check it out uh card on screen and link in the video description below to that video i'll see you there